What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Also, if you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, you're living under a rock, seen this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get in to another mafia topic and one of the most interesting people in the history of the American mafia is Vincent Giganti, the old school boss who feigned a crazy act, stalked the streets of Greenwich Village and lower Manhattan for decades. We've talked occasionally about his subordinates, including Quiet Dom Cirillo. Today, we are going to talk about arguably one of the most powerful individuals in the history of the Genovese crime family, a man that had known Vincent Giganti since they were kids and would ultimately become his underboss in the 80s. The story of Venero Benny Eggs Mangano. Next on Sit Down Shorts, Benny Eggs Mangano was born September 7th, 1921 in Lower Manhattan. His parents would actually emigrate in 1910 from a small town in Catania in Sicily called Ligua Galosa. If you know anything about Catania, it is on the eastern half of Sicily. Now, for Venny Eggs Mangano, his family would actually emigrate right into lower Manhattan, and they would actually marry his parents in 1914. Ben was the third of four children and would be born in 1921. Now, the family would settle ultimately at 88 Thompson Street, uh, basically, interestingly enough, uh, at the top of Ben's Pizza. Now, Ben's Pizza is obviously a new place, but it's interesting how Ben's Pizza is in the place where above Benny Eggs would actually grow up. Benny Eggs, uh, his father actually began as a chicken farmer, allegedly, in lower Manhattan and would ultimately graduate to owning an egg store in the area, thus how Benny Eggs Mangano got his name. According to the 1930 census, uh, Benny Eggs' father, Joe, was a proprietor of that egg store in lower Manhattan. Now, for Benny Eggs, Mangano, he would actually take a different path to the American mafia, unlike many others. Now, if we know anything about the mafia, Vincent Giganti would be born in 1928, basically just up the street from Benny Eggs Mangano. His family would settle at 177 Thompson Street in Greenwich Village. Now, the difference between 177 uh, Thompson Street and 88 Thompson Street is the border between Greenwich Village and what we would call Little Italy, Lower Manhattan. They were both, though, from a very distinct part of New York City. And ultimately, for Benny Eggs Mangano, we'll talk about the fact that he would actually move to uh, 166 Thompson Street after his military service, but we'll get into that in a second. We've also talked before occasionally about different mobsters that have been involved in the military. One of the individuals in the Genovese crime family, Matty the Horse Ainiello, in a video that can be seen up here, was actually very distinguished in the American military as well. Benny Eggs Mangano in the early 40s would actually join the United States Army and be enlisted as a tail gunner in bomber planes. He would actually serve uh, over 30 missions, in fact, 33 missions where he would win uh, many medals. Uh, including the Distinguished Flying Cross and an air medal with four oak leaf cluster, clusters, each indicating performance worthy of an additional air medal, as well as three battle stars. Benny Eggs Mangano was a hero for this country, and he's one of the very few that was distinguished in the military. It's actually quite interesting. He was a man's man. Upon his return, though, after his service, he would come right back to lower Manhattan and by this point, his family actually owned an apartment building at 166 Thompson Street. Benny would move in there and he would begin his criminal career. For Ben uh, Mangano, he would actually be arrested four different times between the late 40s and mid 50s for bookmaking charges. During those times, Benny Eggs Mangano realized that he could control a vast bookmaking operation, take bets, do numbers. And if he were to be caught by the police, they would fine him and that was it. He would be fined various amounts, $50, $200. But on the fourth charge, Benny Eggs Mangano would actually go to prison. He would actually serve 90 days in prison uh, for bookmaking. 
Um, the good thing for Benny Eggs, though, is he was starting to turn some heads in Greenwich Village. And one of the most premier crews in Mafia history was first to be headed the Greenwich Village crew by Tony Bender's trial. He would have control of that crew really for over a 10-year period. And what he would do is basically give Benny Eggs Mangana the ability to run his bookmaking operation, and Benny Eggs would become a member of the Greenwich Village crew of the Genovese crime family. The good thing and the smart thing that Benny Eggs Mangana realized was you make illicit money, you then take the money that you make from those illicit businesses and put it into legit business. And that's exactly what he did. Benny Eggs Mangana would ultimately own a company called M&J Industries. Now, what M&J Industries was, was a company that basically worked with retailers, uh, most notably like Calvin Klein, and actually buy jeans at a discounted rate and sell them around the country and around the world for a markup. And that's exactly what Benny Eggs did. And he would ultimately make hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars in that clothing business, as well as have connections to the garment industry and things of that nature. He was a very smart, old school individual. Benny Eggs Mangana realized you make the illicit money, you do the extortion, you do the loan sharking, you do the union rigging, bid rigging, but you also take that money and you throw it back to legitimate industries. Benny Eggs Mangano was a smart man. And what he was doing was, as I said, not only was he growing in rackets, but he was growing in power. And as he grew, people around him elevated. As we know, Vincent Giganti would ultimately take on a very high profile position in the late 60s into the 70s in the Genovese crime family. One thing we'd also notice, according to the testimony of Cleveland and Los Angeles mobster, Jimmy the Weasel Fratiano, he would talk about a distinct time when he was called upon to meet up allegedly with Benny Eggs Mangano. Mangano reportedly told Fratiano uh, after they were to discuss business about the clothing operations he was in, Fratiano was supposed to meet him at a place called Resource Sales Corporation on Varick Street in Lower Manhattan. Uh, Fratiano would say, or not, it's not Fratiano, this is Fratiano. Fratiano would say at that point that he would go to that building where he would find Mangano uh, basically in a meeting with Tony Salerno and Funzi Thierry, two higher ups in the Genovese crime family. Fratiano realized at that point that this was a very large scale and very powerful individual. And he had really done it over the last 20 years. Benny Eggs had connections and he was someone that would ultimately use them. In 1981, as we know, uh, Benny the Squint Lombardo would move out of the way. And it was likely that Vincent the Chin Giganti took over the day-to-day -day operations of the Genovese crime family. He was the new boss and his old friend, Benny Eggs, was made capo regime of his own crew. Now for Benny Eggs, by this point, he was married to a woman called Louise and they had two children. Benny Eggs had a Sullivan or a Thompson Street social club and his main bodyguard and protege was an individual called John Johnny Sausage Barbado. Barbado was a bit younger than Benny Eggs and became a very uh, legitimate protege of Benny Eggs. You had Benny Eggs and Johnny Sausage. Who does it like? Sausage and eggs, uh, which was a weird crack that I had to make. Now, for Benny Eggs, he would continue to fire up in the leadership chart as well as the money-making chart in the Genovese crime family. The truth is everyone in the Genovese family was A, powerful, and B, very rich. And they made a lot of money, not just in the day-to-day -day industries of the American mafia, but stuff like the New York and New Jersey waterfronts. And that's exactly what Benny... Uh, Mangano did. He would get his hooks in legitimate businesses that were kicking up payments to him, uh, i.e. trucking companies, unions, etc. And the good thing that he had was he had a man at the ports, and that was an individual, a former boxer called John DeGilio. DeGilio was based at a Bayo, New Jersey, and at one point was connected with the Bonanno crime family. Through meeting different people, he would allegedly make his trek over to the Genovese family and was allegedly the man for the family as one of the men in the family on the docks and had his hooks into the ILA and other unions. He was connecting payments up to Benny Eggs and things were working out. The problem, though, for Don John DeGilio would come and it would ultimately come for Benny Eggs Mangano. 
According as well, the Philadelphia Inquirer would report in the 80s that Benny Eggs Mangano was seen multiple times in Atlantic City with other members of the Genovese crime family, including Matty the Horse, Ein Yellow, involving the build of certain casinos in that city as well. So Benny Eggs was a rich man at this point. And by 1987, he would actually become the underboss of the Genovese crime family. After the passing of Saverio Semi Black Centura, uh, Benny Eggs would come under the tutelage and become the underboss. Obviously, the street front boss was Tony Salerno, and the official boss was Vincent Giganti. Though the problem would lie, though, for Benny Eggs and John DiGilio. Money was flowing, things were good, but Do John DiGilio became too big for his britches. Uh, in the mid-80s, he would be arrested for extortion, and a trial would start for jo John DiGilio in May of 1987. And what you do not do in the mob is make a spectacle of court appearances. That's exactly what John DiGilio did. The former boxer showed up with boxing friends, including Jake LaMotta and other boxers, and basically made a big spectacle of this thing. He was also caught on wiretap calling out people like Benny Eggs Mangano, basically saying that he's the man in New Jersey, he's the big man, all that sort of thing. And that's one thing that when you deal with these old school gangsters, if you're making money, things are good. That's great. But when you start showing them up, you start acting like a dickhead, making a spectacle out of things like people like Tony Spilatro did or Mad Sam DiStefano or, or sort of some of these other guys in New York uh, and, and Chicago. The mob's going to make an example of you. John DeGilio would ultimately beat the rap of his extortion case in April of 1988. On May 7th, 1988, though, John DeGilio's wife would report him missing from their Holmdale, New Jersey residence. Several weeks later, on May 26, 1988, the body of John DeGilio would be found floating in Hackensack River. The truth of the matter was, whether Benny Eggs ordered this or not, he was involved likely in this disappearance. And again, when you show up the mafia, they are going to deal with you. Benny Eggs was an earner. He was a power broker. When he needed something taken care of, the Genovese family took care of it. It was that simple. Now, another problem, but another high-end money-making operation that Benny Eggs Mangana was very involved with uh, was, as we hear, the Windows case. Now, I did a video recently on Peter Chiodo, which can be seen here, where I detailed a lot about this Windows operation. Basically, in random circumstance, it was a contract that the mob was basically rigging bids on to basically be in control of installing tens of thousands of windows in the 330 New York housing projects around the five boroughs. As we know, there are windows galore, there are contracts galore, and the mob was making one to $2 off every window. It was estimated by the government that in this housing scam, the American mafia pocketed almost $142 million of the 180 or so that was given by federal grants to make this all happen. The mob was making tons of money on this. And you know who the chief family that was making the most on this was? The Genovese crime family, namely Benny Eggs Mangano, Vincent Giganti, and other high-ranking members. In May, March of 1990, it would all end, though, for the Windows case. This case was a wrap, and the feds were going to bring people to justice on this scam. 15 individuals throughout the five crime families were arrested, including Benny Eggs Mangano, Vincent Giganti, Baldy Dom Cantorino, Genovese Capo Regime, Joe Zito, Gambino heavyweight, Peter Gotti, Lucchese boss and underboss, Vic Amuso and Anthony Casso, as well as other members of the Colombo and Bonanno crime families. This was a big thing for the federal government. They finally believed that they could knock out the mob at the highest levels. Remember, people like Tony Salerno and Tony Ducks and Paul Castano were all either murdered or put in prison, as well as Carmen Persico and other high-ranking members. This was a big case for the American mafia. The chief witness was this individual, Peter Blackheart Savino. Now, Savino 
had been an associate of the Genovese crime family since the 1960s. He was very dialed into different unions, including iron workers and ornament unions. And Peter Savino was very connected. In fact, Peter Savino was actually uh, suspected in multiple murders that were committed by the Genovese crime family. Savino had decided to cooperate. And this was a major issue for the mob. Peter Savino, by cooperating, was going to basically indict pretty much everybody, including people like Benny Eggs Mangano. Mangano can be seen and heard on multiple wiretaps where basically he is basically describing the fact that he is the conduit between the streets and Vincent Giganti. As we know with Chin, he had multiple messengers, including Dom Cantorino, Dom Cirillo, Benny Eggs. Also, Benny Eggs was basically talking about this conspiracy uh, on wiretap. Uh, at one point, you know, he was discussing the fact that they pretty much owned everything and that the certain families shouldn't try to muscle in on their big percentage. He was basically saying that they were supposed to get the most profit in this case. He would make comments like, you know, it's all flowing up and that we are going to get the lion's share of this contract. He also would talk about on tape at one point, Peter Savino would mention the name Chin on a conversation. As anyone knows that there's anything about Chin Giganti, if you ever mentioned his name on tape, you could be marked for death. At one point, Savino makes a comment about um, you know, Chin on the tape. Benny Eggs Mangano basically scolds him and says, do not say that name, which would also lead to a conspiracy down the road. Uh, now, in August of 1990, Peter Savino would... Uh, unsuccessfully unsuccessfully be attempted to be killed by the mafia. And at one point, uh, the federal government would actually find a bomb strapped to the car of Peter Savino's wife that didn't ultimately go off. The mob was trying to kill uh, Peter Savino. The problem was it wouldn't matter. For Benny Eggs Mangana, there was too much testimony that would hurt him in this situation. And in March of 1993, Benny Eggs Mangana would be convicted and receive 188 months in federal prison, just south of 16 years. For Benny Eggs Mangano, he'd have to wonder, was this a death sentence? He was 71 years old. He would likely get out at 85. It's likely that he probably wouldn't get out of prison. Uh, Benny Eggs would report and head away. In 1997, though, Peter Savino would be called on again to take part in a major racketeering and murder trial against Vincent Giganti. Now, by this point, Savino was badly stricken from cancer, but would still aid in the defense of the federal government. Another person that'd be called as a witness in this case was Benny Eggs Mangano, who came from prison uh, on behalf of the government, at least they thought, to talk. Now, the government knew that it was likely that Benny Eggs Mangano was basically going to tell them to go fuck themselves. Mangano would outright refuse to testify in the case and joked about the court's inability to compel him to testify with, quote, what do you want to do? Shoot me? Shoot me. I'm not answering any questions. I'm tired of these charades. You gave me 15 years already. I'm 76. Where am I going? That right there, folks, is a stand-up individual, a last of the Mohicans type of quote. This is a man that definitely accepted the fact that he was a gangster, Omerta meant something, and he was never, ever going to bend for anyone. He told them, basically, go fuck yourself. You gave me 15 years already. Let me do my time in peace. Benny Eggs Mangana would do his time in peace and ultimately would spend the rest of his sentence in relative anonymity. Wouldn't you know it, even after surprising doctors, after surviving two heart attacks and multiple surgeries, Venera Mangano would be released from federal prison in May of 2006. He would spend about six months in a halfway house in Brooklyn and finally be released in November of 2006 at the ripe old age of 85. Say what you want about gangsters. But there are very few that have the story of Benny Eggs Mangano, a man that was a hero in the American military, definitely was involved in things. We can't lie and say that he didn't probably do things he wasn't supposed to do. 
but he beat the government a couple of times. And in the end, and we'll talk about what his son would say at his funeral, he was truly one of the randoms that we don't talk about enough. He was a guy that was extremely respected and for the most part, a really good guy, at least to most people. Now, was he a killer and a mobster? He was a mobster. Would I say he's a killer? No, there's no proof of that uh, that I know of. Now, obviously, during all this, Vincent Giganti uh, would ultimately get a 12-year prison sentence, and we know how everything would shake out with him. Uh, and the chief witness in that case was Peter Savino. His old protege, Johnny Sausage Barbata, would ultimately uh, make his own uh, higher-up decision. He would become a higher-up in the Genovese crime family in the mid-2000s, uh, and he is actually still alive himself. Benny Eggs Mangana would live out the rest of his life on the streets, uh, in his Charlton Street, lower uh, Manhattan home, uh, and uh, really just kind of do his thing. Uh, the feds would try to say that Benny Eggs was still involved with the mafia, but there was really no truth in that. Uh, Benny Eggs Mangana would die on August 18th, 2017, at the age of 95 years old. Uh, recently, uh, during the death of Benny Eggs Mangano, a former New York Police Department detective called John McNally, who had once visited Mangano in prison uh, after he tried to overturn his Windows case after he became a private eye, would say, quote, he was always a gentleman with me. Benny really got a bum rap because Gaspipe talked about killing witnesses and then they killed that union official. Benny prayed a heavy price for that. I never saw a dark side to him if he had one. And Benny would also talk about the fact that during his time in World War II, his plane was actually hit by enemy fire, but that he would joke about the fact that during Normandy, he was actually up in the air during that time. Um, so he was never truly at risk. But um, anyone that knew Benny Eggs would constantly talk about the fact that he was not a violent individual. He was just a mobster who lived during the golden age of the mob. Benny Eggs Mangano was buried alongside his wife at St. John Roman Catholic Cemetery in Middle Village, Queens. I will leave you with a quote from Benny Eggs' son at his funeral. He would say, quote, he was a great father. I wish I could be a tenth of what he was, a man with integrity. He told me at an early age to always remember that your word is your bond, and he lived by it. There lies a man's man. And I couldn't have said it better myself. I know sometimes we paint these people as heroes, and I'm not painting anybody as a hero. But in the true essence of keeping your mouth shut and living your life as a man's man, there is no one that orchestrates that bigger than Venero Benny Eggs Mangano, a true man's man, and one of the most underrated people in the history of the mob. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button. And let me know what you think in the comment section below. And make sure you subscribe so you never miss another video. We'll see you next week here on this.